Hi, welcome to the signal path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an Agilent MXG analog signal generator. I don't think we've ever actually looked at an MXG up to this frequency before. Now, this is an analog signal generator because it doesn't have the vector generation capabilities, which is unfortunate because that's pretty useful, especially up to these higher frequencies. But nonetheless, this is a really great synthesizer in a small form factor. So getting it repaired would be very good for the lab. So let's give it a try and see what the problem could be. So right now we're set to 1 gigahertz and 0 dBm. If I enable the output, uh, nothing happens. It's not throwing any errors out. It's not doesn't have the, you know, the PLL unlocks or any other issues, which is good. Let's go ahead and change the frequency. Let's change 1 gigahertz at a time. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So far, so good. 9, 10. So far, oh, there you go. All right, here it is. So at 11 gigahertz, we have an unlevel condition right there. 12, 13, 14, 15. 16, 17, <laughs> it's gone 18 gigahertz, which is unusual, and 19, and 20. Okay, interesting. Well, we should definitely look at the output and see what it's throwing out, but it is, it does work at 17, it stops at 17, which is really unusual. So these instruments are rely on a lot of internal multiplication, so we're going to have to look at the block diagram and see where that problem actually could be coming from. But we have a lot of information already, which is quite useful. So first thing first, let's look at this output and see what we're getting. Okay, let's go ahead and use the field fox to take a look at the signal. I've done a full review of this instrument. It's fantastic. It's essentially a software-defined radio anywhere in the band and in network analyzer. So let's go ahead and try and see. So it's 1 gigahertz. Looks okay. Let's keep going higher and higher in frequency. So this is the area for which everything is working. And no surprise, it does work. Here we go. That's still okay. And still okay. Ah, look at that. Right there. That's exactly where the unlevel condition actually comes into play. And we are indeed do have a problem. Now, interestingly, the noise floor also changes, as you can see. There's definitely a noise floor shift as well. So we have to take a look and see why that could be. And if I go higher and higher in frequency, does it come back at some point? And it does. Yeah. So that also makes sense. So the unlevel condition does go away at this frequency. And it does that exactly in measurement too. Okay, so we have a lot of information. So the signal doesn't completely disappear. Its amplitude is just really bad, and then all of a sudden it recovers. So we know all the boundary conditions of where the signal is and what kind of power we're getting and what happens in the noise floor. Let's take out all that info and take a look at the block diagram now. And here's the block diagram of the N5183, which is the MXG, of course, and you can see that it's broken into two primary sections. There is the RF assembly here, and then there is the A7 micro deck. The micro deck is what's responsible for generating frequencies basically above 3 gigahertz or so. So in fact, the version of this instrument that only goes up to 3 gigahertz will be basically missing most of the stuff here because it's not needed and the output can be directly driven from the A3 RF assembly. And they don't show you the details of the CPU or anything else like that because there is no really no reason for it because there's all digital circuits and what they're really showing you here is what happens to the RF as it gets manipulated through various components. This is useful even if you were not repairing the unit because it tells you something about where various harmonics would be, where spurious tones would be placed, what happens to the noise floor and so on and on as different switches go in and out. So if you look at this here, the left side, the RF assembly, is for low frequencies. Now we know that works, and this instrument relies on multiplying that low frequency to higher and higher frequencies, even up to 40 gigahertz, as you can see over here, which is not used at all in this case, because we don't have this option enabled. So we can basically pretty much ignore the synthesizers, the fractional and PLLs, and the reference and the ALC and the RF part, because that's pretty much covered. If this stuff wasn't working, nothing would be working at the output. Not, nothing up to 10 gigahertz would be working. So we know that this is probably okay. So let's take that for granted for a second and just look at the A7 micro deck. So here's the beginning of the A7 micro deck assembly over here and the 20 gigahertz frequency multiplier is probably the most relevant thing to us initially. Now from the left side is where the RF board was and you can see that frequencies from 250 kilohertz to 6 gigahertz come out of that and if you didn't have the high frequency option that just basically finds its way to the output. Now, for the frequencies between 2.5 to 5 gigahertz, we enter the 20 gigahertz frequency multiplier. And that internally is multiplied yet again and has different bandpass filtering. This architecture is really quite common. That's how you clean up all the harmonics and you get to the higher frequencies, starting from lower synthesizers. So there's some uh, low-pass filtering over here. And then we have a doubler, and that doubler brings us from 5 to 8. So 2.5 to 4 gigahertz go through over here probably some other frequencies go through in here. It's interesting that there are two doublers. I'm not sure why they've done that. There's also a pass-through path, the 3.225 directly going to the output. So over at this point, 
we can cover 3.2 to 10 gigahertz by the use of multipliers from 2.5 to 5 gigahertz. I'm not quite sure again why there was two of them. It could be that another one is used for again the multiplier down below to get you to 20 gigahertz. Maybe there's some harmonic cleaning they had to do over there. But the path of 20 gigahertz basically starts from here that already covers up to 10 gigahertz and it goes into this and gets doubled again. So if this doubler produces 10 to 20, the input to this doubler has to be from 5 to 10. And that goes through a bank of bandpass filtering to clean it up. There's some variable gain amplifier, and then there's a final output switch that mixes the two together in order to give you the entire coverage. So I don't know why this says 3.2 to 10 gigahertz. It should really say 3.2 to 20 gigahertz because all the higher frequency stuff is there too. And you can see this 10 to 20 gigahertz is basically the result of this signal in case you want to multiply it again and get yourself to 40, which again, we don't have in this case. So there's a couple of things to look at. What could, it, could the problem be somewhere in here? Well, I guess technically it could be because you do have multiple switches over here. Although the filter here is labeled 13 to 20 and 13 to 20 is already overlapping part of the place it's not working. So yeah, maybe, I'm a little bit skeptical it is in here, but nonetheless, we will take a look at it. An easy way to isolate this is actually to work backwards and go and look at this signal and look at this signal and completely disable all the ALC loops. If you do this, then you can see if this is producing a constant amplitude with enough power so that the ALC loop can actually operate on it. If this signal over here still shows us the same problem, that it doesn't work above 10 gigahertz correctly, then we know that it's not the fault of the later stages. The fault is entirely captured within the 20 gigahertz frequency multiplier, and we can look at that module on its own. Now remember that none of these service manuals ever tell you anything about exactly how these are built, because from their point of view, you would just throw away this entire block and replace it. The entire frequency multiplier thing, as it's an entire block on its own, which of course we don't want to do because that's too expensive. I want to see if there is any way to repair it simpler. If not, we'll have to replace the entire module ourselves too. And then the rest of it is pretty straightforward. We have a detector at the output. This detector detects all the frequencies uh, from 2 to 20 in this case, and then that's how ALC is actually controlled. And this modulation filter is for the AM and PM and whatever, all the other modulation that's going on top of this signal. So that's what I would do. I would identify this block over here, to make these disconnections, and do some measurements and see if it leads us to anything. So it's the instrument from the top, and it has the RF micro deck in there and everything else that connects to the output. The actual RF section with the synthesizers and the PLLs and everything is on the other side of the board and is fully covered. Anyway, so if you work our way backwards from the output, so this connection right over here is connected to the front panel. We have our mechanical attenuator over here. Then we go through our coupler in the high band, and that comes from the filter modulation block that I talked about. This is going to have two inputs to it. One input over here that covers frequencies 3 to 20, and this one over here which covers frequencies below 3 gigahertz. Now we don't have to worry about this particular line over here. We're going to look at this one which is coming from this block over here. And that means that this is our 20 gigahertz frequency multiplier. Now the input to this should be coming from the other side of the board. And if you look carefully, there's a coax that comes over here and it goes into the board. And that coax going into the board goes over there and goes inside of this. And the output of that is taken out from there and fed over here. That all lines up and this is for below 3 gigahertz. So the components are really easy to identify. Now the nice thing about this block over here is that it only has three connections to this entire instrument. One is this ribbon cable, which is flexible, and it's got this one, which is from the RF board from the other side of the board, and the output, which is fed over here. So if we disconnect those, we can actually take this entire thing out if you ever need to. We'll take a look at it and see if that's what we have to do or not. But I can look at this one, which is the input to it, and I can look at that one, which is the output from it. And from that, we're going to follow exactly what the block diagram was showing. Okay, so step number one, we're going to look at the signal being fed into the multiplier. So that's coming from inside the board from the other side. And I have set the instrument to essentially sweep from DC to 20 gigahertz. Now keep in mind that in that range, the frequency that's coming out of here is essentially limited from about 2 to 3 gigahertz all the way up to 5 gigahertz. And we should see that sweeping back and forth, back and forth as it goes through the different ranges. Let's see if it does that. So keep in mind that because the MXG is sweeping linearly from DC to 20 gigahertz, the frequency fed into the multiplier is not swept linearly because it's going to be multiplied by 2 and then multiplied by 4. And we will see this right here. So the signal is clearly present. So right now, let's wait for the sweep to finish. So here's the first sweep. This is direct. You can see it goes fast. Then times 2, it goes a little bit slower. 
and then times 4 it goes even slower and that's to be expected and that's exactly what you should get the amplitude is over 0 dBm there's some losses in that cable so we are perfectly fine so I think the input to that multiplier is working without any issues it's time now to put that connection back and look at the output of the multiplier see if it has the exact same problem the actual instrument does Okay, everything exactly the same, except we're looking at the output of the multiplier. The instrument is still sweeping from DC to 20 gigahertz. So the problem is, of course, now very obvious. So from DC to 10 gigahertz, the signal is present, and then all of a sudden it drops, which is what we were seeing before. Now, there were other amplification stages after this block, and that's why that signal was so much larger. I also have disabled the ALC. But if I put this on max hold for a second, we can let the this actually sweep in. You can see the, where the amplitude drops. Oh, you were seeing the second harmonics. But yeah, so ignore these bigger tones, those are the second harmonics, but there it is. You see that the bottom signal is where it should be. Everything should be flat at the top. So indeed, there is definitely a problem, and we now have narrowed it down to the multiplier. So it's time to open that block and see what's inside. So here's that board outside of the instrument. Now this deserves a lot of analysis on its own, so I'm going to take some pictures of it and do some x-rays so we can talk about it in detail. But the way it's put together is that it's thermally connected to the top of the lid, and of course individual sections are all RF shielded from each other. All the important ICs are on one side, and on the other side, we have just basically a lot of DC uh, connections and power supplies and so on. These are the main connections going in and out of the chip. There's nothing RF on this side. Interesting that they just blob these directly on top of the thermal pads. There's one big one over here, which is connected to this one. Now, this thermal material is now already destroyed, so I'm going to have to find another one to put in its place. You can put this on this side, of course. First of all, it wouldn't matter because these chips are not top-cooled, they're bottom-cooled, and that's why you need them on the other side. There's thermal vias in the board for that purpose. Um, but at the same time, if you put this thermal material on top of these traces that are exposed, you will destroy the RF performance, so that's not going to work anyway. But nonetheless, let's go ahead and take a look at this and analyze it a bit more in detail. So here we have the picture of the board on the left and the x-ray of that board on the right. I've already rotated and aligned everything together. Now taking an x-ray of this board is rather difficult because it has so much metal in it and so many metal layers on top of each other. So I really have to push the x-ray machine to its limit. The x-ray machine is only 35 kilovolt and this is a 19 second exposure. But still we get a lot of detail from it and it's enough to help us, uh, guide us in the direction we want to go. So of course we have the block diagram which is this guy over here and it's fairly straightforward to identify what's going on once you look at it for a little bit. So here's the input on this side and that's the input on this side. And then first we have a digital attenuator here and then we have an amplifier and then we have a low pass filter using these butterfly stops. And right over here is where we end essentially this point. Okay, So from there on we're going to have to have a switch, a bunch of multipliers and then amplifiers again. So here's our switch in the front end and the switch goes onto this side, so that's one path, then there's another path, and then there's another path, and there's a no connect path, which is on this side. So the reason they have two different multipliers is actually because these multipliers are not as broadband as I thought they were. And as a result, you're going to have to break them into two because they cover different frequency ranges in reality. So we have a doubler over here, and we have another doubler over here, and then we have some amplifier stages. You can see some over here, some over here, and then we have another switch that splits into two. So if you go back, you can identify all of those blocks. So here's the first multiplier, another multiplier, this is the pass-through path, and then we have three band path filters and a switch in front of one of them. So here's the switch in front of one of them. So here's one band pass filter, here's another one, and then here's the last one. So this gives us the three different sections that uh, we need to band pass in order to cover the frequencies below 10 gigahertz. And if you look, you can very, very clearly see those band pass filter structures embedded in between the layers. This is quite common. We've seen that many, many times before. And then we have a switch that's going to select between those stages uh, with respect to each other. So if you go back over here, you can see that these we're looking for basically a 4 to 1 switch somewhere. If I go back, you can indeed see that there is four sections here. Here's 1, here's 2, here's 3, and here's 4, and that covers all the paths. This is the pass-through path, by the way, this way. This is the other filter path. So there's four of them. And then we have the, the, the switch that selects it, and we have another digital attenuator. And then we're going through this part. Now all the Agilent branded components actually start. So these are going to be quite difficult to replace. So if this first Agilent branded component, again, I couldn't find really any information about them, but just by looking at this, this must be a DC to 10 gigahertz amplifier, probably some gas part that they have made themselves and packaged. So this is going to amplify everything below 10 gigahertz. So it doesn't need to process anything above 10 gigahertz because we're dealing with this component over here. And then we have a switch here, and a doubler, and a triple switch again. Now, I think that they have combined this in actually into one component. And that component is this one over here. If you look carefully, we have the signal coming in over here, 
and then he comes out and if I follow this path this path goes all the way out and it goes in the final output switch I think that path is basically this one right here okay so we're covering that one and then this section is the section that we're looking for afterwards and indeed we do have the D3 filters here's one here's two here's three you can see those sections this is the pass through path that I was highlighting you can see it makes it all the way to the output so then when we have the filters which is these three filter paths they all go into another part which is another agile and branded part and that is going to now combine these three paths into one output and that is exactly what we see here the three filters come together and the output of that is taken this way which is that and then we have one final switch and this final switch is basically this component right here there's a low pass filter after it I don't really see the low pass filter anywhere it might be outside of this board but that's it that's how that's the entire architecture so it's pretty straightforward in terms of RF design so there's a couple of places we need to now measure to see where this problem could come from so let's think about that so if we do have stuff below 10 gigahertz working uh, let me get rid of all of these so if the stuff below 10 gigahertz is all functional then this entire section at the bottom we don't have to worry about it that's all working this switch must be working this attenuator must be working and this amplifier must be working otherwise we would not get the 10 gigahertz amplitude to be correct now as soon as this amplifier ends basically at this point forward is where the problem starts now this could be faulty because if this is not doubling it's not going to provide the signal above 10 gigahertz and this is my currently my guess of what's wrong the pass through path of this this pass through this is must be working because if it wasn't we wouldn't be able to get the less than 10 gigahertz signal so at least that path is there but the doubler in there that selects here here and here that could be bad the other possibility is that this could be bad because if this is producing the double signal and this is not selecting them the switch could be broken that could be another place where the signal could not make it to the output the other thing that could be bad is potentially this path of the switch because there's a there's a selector in there but again if this is working for one path and not for the other hmm, I'm a little bit skeptical so I would first basically measure this guy and then measure that guy now since we can run this outside of the instrument it should be reasonably straightforward to connect active probes here and monitor those signals Now these signals are sitting from 10 to 20 but we don't need to go all the way to 20 because we know it stops working immediately after 10 gigahertz so we can connect our active probe to these terminals and measure and see if there is anything coming out of them if these are working perfectly and they actually have the signal we're looking for and we have to find out which of them is actually the one that operates at 11 gigahertz we can move around to find out then the next place to measure is this because these filters are almost certainly going to be fine I mean, they're just embedded in the board so that would be my measurement strategy it would be to basically check this chip and check this chip and then maybe this one if things are still unclear but even if you find it, I'm a little bit worried because I'm not so sure where to get the replacement for these parts. But at least we will find the problem. Let's take it one step at a time. All right, so here's our setup to measure the response of those ICs that we just talked about. So the board here is in an angle with a fan behind it. This is pretty important because this normally has a lot of heat sink around it, as you saw. And I have it connected to the instrument, essentially how it would normally be. It's not perfect because it doesn't have all the cavities around it, but it would be enough for us to do the measurement. And of course, we have the field fox here on the left that we're going to use. And in order to get the signal into it, we have an active probe and an active probe power supply over here. So this is the tip of the active probe. So we're going to be able to probe directly the actual surface of the PCB. And this is a 12 gigahertz active probe. So operating this thing at frequencies just below 12 gigahertz is enough. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to configure this to jump between 9.5 gig and 10.5 gig so 1 gigahertz up and down and it's going to do that every half a second 9.5 gigahertz would put us before the multiplier and 10.5 right after the multiplier so when I probe these you can see the signal jump back and forth and we can monitor all the things that need to switch in and out in order to produce the 10.5 gigahertz signal so we will right away find out which path we need to look at and more importantly if that path is actually functional so let's do a quick measurement to make sure that the DC switching of these ICs is actually happening because we have multiple paths of course and these are 3.5 technologies probably indium phosphide from Keysight themselves and they need to switch between paths so they need some you know, large negative voltage and then positive voltage to choose the particular RF path that they are controlling so we can go ahead and make that measurement now this, the circuit is jumping between 9.5 gig to 10.5 gig so we expect some of that activity on the switches so here's the power supply there you go, 4.8 volt, it's there. Now, I'm going to look for some of those voltages that are responsible for the switching. You can typically find them because there is resistors and capacitors on those nodes and so on. So I think this is one of them. 
There you go, take a look. Look, it goes from minus 9.8 to zero, just above zero, and that's basically the turning on and off. It could be a pin diode somewhere, maybe it could be some switch they have built into their own process. There's another one also, should be another complementary one. Here's another one. This is actually the opposite uh, phase, but you can't see because they're looking at one at a time, of course. And the exact architecture isn't important. What's important is that those switching activities are actually present. So that's important. If those switching wasn't happening, of course, you're not going to get any RF performance out of it. So once we make sure that DC is okay, and I've already checked it for all the ICs, we know that's not the issue, that it's getting the correct signal. It's a matter of now checking it at RF. Okay, so let's go ahead and first probe the output that is working. So we know this, I'm actually just hovering the probe above the board and it's already picking up something. You can appreciate why the EM shielding is so important. So I'm gonna bring the probe and put it on the pad that is supposed to pass the nine and a half gigahertz signal, but not the 10 and a half gigahertz signional. So we would expect to see a strong nine and a half gig signal coming from that, that's switching every half a second or so. So let's put that on there. There it is. And keep in mind that, oh, I just missed it. Keep in mind that the probe also has about 10 dB of loss. There it is. So that signal looks good. You can see it's pure. Uh, there's nothing else around it. It's a nice 9.5 gigahertz signal, and it is indeed working. So now I'm going to go ahead and search the outputs of the multiplier, and one of them should be for the 10.5 gigahertz frequency range. And we should see at least a little bit of signal there. So let's see if it is, is it this one. No, nope, I see nothing. I see the feed through of the 9.5 gigahertz, but I don't see anything at 10.5. Let's try the second path. It's difficult to probe this. Ah, there it is. Look at that. But check it out. It is a tiny signal. It's sitting way, way lower, minus 40 dBm in this case. Even if I add 10 dB to it, it's still at minus 30. It's the wrong power. The 9.5 gigahertz is also leaking through still, but it's filtered by the later stages. One of the reasons why those bandpass filters are there in the first place. So yeah, I think that pretty much confirms it. This tells us that the path of the 10.5 gigahertz signal inside of that chip is actually broken, and that's why it's not passing it. If I go to the one of the other outputs, again, I shouldn't see much. There you go, here's another one. That's not a 10.5 gigahertz path. It has a little bit of leakage, but the actual path that we're interested in, I, I think I found it. That's this one. Now I can carry on down the chain and look at the final, final output that goes into the instrument's output. And if I can land on that path, path right there, we should be able to see there you go, that's the difference. See, the 9.5 gigahertz signal is nice and big, and the 10.5 gigahertz signal, even though it's amplified, is still pretty, pretty small. So there you go, that pretty much explains exactly what chip is the suspect. And for completeness here, I wanted to show you where I was probing. So first I was probing this pin right here, and that pin is the low frequency output, the output below 10 gigahertz, and that was working fine. Then we have one, two, three possible outputs for the multiply signal, and the middle one was the one that operates at 10.5 gig. I also probed right there, which the signals combined, which means that these chips are all working. So yeah, so this is the part that has gone bad, and that's the part that needs to be replaced, unfortunately. And I spent a really long time looking for that component, and it is impossible to find. I looked all over Chinese vendors, all over eBay, everywhere I could find, and there was just no luck. I even asked on EV Block if anyone has a spare. So far, I haven't gotten any. So we have to stop here, even though we know exactly what's wrong with the instrument. We're just one chip away from fixing the entire thing and have it operate perfectly, but unfortunately, we have to wait. If you guys know or happen to know where I can get one of these chips, I would love to have it so we can replace it and get this unit back to working condition. So I'll label this repair as part one for now. I hope you enjoyed it. There was still a lot of investigation. And as always, thanks to the Patreon supporters, you make these things possible. As you can imagine, even these instruments, even in their broken state, are still quite pricey. So thanks always. I'll see you in the comment section. <music>